It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, late yesterday, the Conservatives finally took a page from the NDP's housing plan, Homes You Can Afford, a full year Order. after our plan was Order. released. Certainly, Speaker, raising, raising the tax charged on non-resident -res speculators Good who call. make millions Good playing call, the right? housing market is a long overdue measure, but there's so much more to be done. Will this government be announcing further actions to crack down on the housing speculation that just drives up costs for everyday families? To respond on behalf of the government, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I'm, I'm proud of the progress that our government's been able to do on the housing supply yeah. issue yeah. under the leadership of Premier Ford. You know, you know, Speaker. Um, since our, our housing supply action plan was uh, passed in 2019, uh, we found that there's been much improvement in uh, the housing supply issue, the, the, the uh, an enormous amount of purpose-built rental that's, uh, that's being built in the province going back to the early 90s. Um, but we know that there's much more to do, yes. and, and we need to do it, Speaker, uh, in conjunction with other levels of government. And We really need our municipal partners to, to do their part to ensure that we put a process in place that gets housing built faster at the speed that Ontarians not just need but deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government has nothing to be proud of when it comes to housing. They have a dismal record uh, in making homes more affordable. For four years, they did nothing to tackle rampant speculation. They have consistently showed much more interest in helping friends and donors build warehouses on protected wetlands than in bringing down the cost of housing. Speaker, the NDP has called for an annual speculation and vacancy tax on residential properties property like they have in British Columbia, a tax that would apply to speculators who are here in Ontario, as well as non-residents. Speaker, will this government do that? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, Speaker, you know, the, the announcement yesterday that the Finance Minister and I made was, was pretty clear. We, we've now got the, the, the most comprehensive non-resident speculation tax in Canada, so we're delivering on those demand side, uh, the, the demand side issues. But let's make let's let's not let's not cloud the issue, Speaker. Every single time that our government has put forward recommendations uh, to deal with the housing supply issue, New Democrats have voted against it. Every time we've put uh, amendments on the floor, bills on the floor to protect tenants. To, to strengthen our community housing. Every time we've increased investments uh, in, in new affordable housing in partnership with our municipalities, every single time, New Democrats have said no. Sure. Speaker, I'm going to make it very clear to Ontarians, under the leadership of Once. Premier Ford, we're going to get it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The final supplementary. <laughs> Speaker, Speaker, young people who are starting out in the housing market needs a plan that helps them. We should be pulling out all the stops to address the housing crisis in this province. The NDP's plan for housing includes measures to, scur to curb speculation as well as real rent control, desperately needed investments in social housing and more. Speaker, will we see any of these other measures from the NDP's plan announced today? Minister, you know, Speaker, again, uh, I, I want to put some statistics on the floor as a compare to the NDP voting no all the time. So the year after we introduced our Housing Supply Action Plan uh, in 2020, uh, we saw 81,000 housing starts, the highest level in over a decade, and 11,000 rental starts highest since 1992. The next year, Speaker, 2021, we saw 100,000 housing starts, the highest we've seen since 1987, and again, more than 13,000 rental units, which is the highest since the early 90s. Every single time, Speaker, every single time, New Democrats have said no. Their housing plan is no, our housing plan is yes. Again, Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we're going to get it done, Speaker. Stop the clock.
you start the clock. The next question, member for Nickel Bell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Minister, many residents of Sudbury and Nickel Bell have approached my office complaining about a new health service that they are being pressured to purchase in order to receive basic health care services from their family physician. Sparrow Health is an online product that charges patients for services that was always free before. To get a doctor's note, a prescription renewal without waiting for an appointment, Sparrow Health will make that happen. Just give them $20 or the price of an annual subscription. With so many people who can barely afford the cost of their prescription, does this minister believe that it is okay for people to have to pay an extra $20 for the services of their family physician? To reply, the Minister of Health. I thank the member opposite for the questions. We know there are many uh, services that are covered under OHIP. In some circumstances, their physician may be able to charge extra for some of the services that aren't covered by, for OHIP. But for basic services, you're absolutely right. People should be covered. Getting a prescription renewed, some of the other services that you mentioned, you're absolutely right. They should not be charged for that. No. And the supplementary question. Currently, Sparrow Health is telling residents of Nickel Belt to pay $20 or wait for the next in-person appointment with their family physician. This company is profiting off the doctor shortage, frankly created by the Liberal government, but not helped very much by this one. The average wait time for a family physician in Nickel Belt is four to six weeks. Jody, in my writing, needed her prescription medication renewed. She had to pay $20 plus a $10 fee to have the prescription faxed the same day. That's $30 that she had to pay for services that are covered by OHIP if she goes and sees her family physician. Does the minister believe it is acceptable for people to have to use their credit card to get basic medical care from their own family physician instead of their OHIP card? Mr. Health. Um, I would agree with you that people should not have to pay for basic medical care that is covered by OHIP, but I would say with respect to your comment about not having enough family doctors in the north or primary care physicians or whoever else is providing the care, our government is investing in an additional 160 undergraduate spaces and 295 postgraduate spaces, the biggest expansion in terms of medical students entering schools in over a decade. The, one of the uh, chief um, uh, organizations, there's six that are receiving these uh, positions and funding over the next few years. One is the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which is receiving 30 undergraduate positions and 41 postgraduate positions. So that should certainly help with this situation, although, as you say, the uh, payment for basic medical care from your own family Response. doctor is not something that uh, we would uh, condone. So, but we should have more doctors on the system in the next few years to, uh, to deal with this. The final supplementary. So, Speaker, let me tell you what's happening right now. Many people cannot afford these fees, so they are now booking unnecessary medical appointments to avoid to have to pay the $20 or $30 associated with their prescription renewal, which, I want to repeat it, was always renewed for free before. So in Northern Ontario, where we are short 300 physicians, people are booking unnecessary appointments with their family physician because they cannot afford to pay. It does not stop there, Speaker. You can now get a physiotherapy, chiropractor, orthotics, massage therapy prescription, whether you need them or not, without ever seeing a physician, just give money to Sparrow Health and voila. This privatization of our healthcare system has to stop. Care should be based on needs, not on ability to pay. Question. Does the minister agree? Well, what I would certainly say is the activities of one group, the Sparrow Group, is not indicative of anything else happening within our system. We can certainly look into what's happening with Sparrow, but there is no privatization going on in our health care system. We've actually increased our uh, investments in our public health care system since we took office by $4.8 billion. That is in our public health care system. And we have not expanded any private health care whatsoever. Anything that's happening 
It's a uh, systems that have already been there. Response. Prior to, we have not issued any new medical licenses for independent health facilities or private hospitals since 1973. At that time, there were 80 private hospitals. Today, there are only four. Clearly indicates we're not making investments there. We're making investments in our public health care system. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Ontario recently lost Kristen Legault Donkers, a master's graduate, children's author, and award winning advocate. She was lost to suicide. Kristen fought tirelessly for system change. In 2019, she slept on the ER floor and awaited 24 hours for mental health help. There just aren't enough supports. Her obituary reads After years of battling her own demons, along with the bureaucracy of our mental health care system, the system that she fought so passionately for, failed her. The current lack of mental health supports in my community is hurting everyone. The CMHO states that children under 18 wait as long as two and a half years to receive mental health treatment. How is that possible in Canada's richest province? What does this government have to say to Kristen's family and families who are waiting while their children are suffering? The Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Clearly, Prior to going to having the pandemic in the province, we've seen that there was a crisis with mental health and addictions, and that's why our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, worked and created the Roadmap to Wellness, agreeing to invest $525 million annually over 10 years for a total of $3.8 billion to create the very system that's missing. And that system, Mr. Speaker, is not only to look after adults, but after children, our seniors. It's a continuum of care. It looks at the different uh, uh, during the lifespan, different ages, and ensures that there are supports for them. It's a program that looks at creating connections between different uh, 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 communities and creating the, the continuum of care that's required for them, whether it's addictions or mental health care supports. In addition to that, it's culturally sensitive. It focuses on all people in all regions of the province of Ontario, rural, municipal, uh, urban, and of course, agricultural. And we're gonna continue making those investments for the people of the province of Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Respectfully, through you, Speaker, to the member, funding over 10 years won't help Kristen. My question is back to the Premier. Kristen needed our help. She advocated for others, worked with psychiatrists and social workers, and still it was an uphill battle. One of the first acts this government made when they took power was to cut $335 million from promised mental health funding. Order. Dr. Jared Berman, a child and adolescent clinical psychologist in my riding, shared with me. A youth in our area sought mental health counselling, but walk-in services had a different person every time. No continuity of care, no relationship of trust, the cornerstones of good mental health care. Lucky that this individual had partial parental benefit coverage, they were told a minimum of a six-month wait, but more than likely a year. Speaker, Ontarians need to see better support of mental health care now, so families aren't burdened with high bills so, so their kids get the care that they deserve. Question. Will this government return the $335 million they cut in mental health, yes or no? Great. Associate Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This illusion of $335 million continues to completely elude logic. This was a commitment that was made by the Liberal government as a last-ditch attempt during the last election to try to win voters over. Yeah. This government made a commitment of the $3.8 billion here, here. and is investing those dollars now. Thank you. And, Mr. Speaker, the investments that are making are game changers. They are transformational to the system. They are creating continuums of care for people with addictions in providing everything from detox beds to addiction treatment beds to supportive beds. We're making investments with the Ministry of Housing in ensuring that we have supportive housing for individuals, truly addressing the underlying issues of mental health and addictions in this province, which has to do with the social determinants of health, which I'm sure you understand. Spons. Now, these investments are being made, and it's hundreds of millions of dollars that no government in the past has yeah. ever yeah. taken the time or energy yeah. to invest in. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. 
Thank you, Speaker. It's no secret that our government inherited a massive infrastructure deficit from the Wendell Duca Liberals. For 15 years, we saw the Wendell Duca Liberals refuse to invest in badly needed roads, bridges, highways, and now Ontarians are paying the price. By 2051, the population of the Greater Golden Horseshoe is forecasted to grow to 14.9 million people. That's 200,000 people, the equivalent of Welland, St. Catharines, and Grimsby combined moving into the region every single year. So, can the Minister of Transportation please tell us what this government is doing to invest and prepare our infrastructure for this population surge? Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you so much to the member from Niagara West for the question. Speaker, the member is right that the previous Liberal governments were short-sighted on transportation planning. But good news for Ontarians, under our government, things are changing. For instance, I was pleased, Speaker, to join the Premier just a few weeks ago to announce our long-term transportation vision for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. This plan sets out a path to 2051, including more than 100 near-term actions to tackle the infrastructure deficit that the Liberals created and to accommodate the massive population growth that is already here, Speaker. So, so whether you're a student using transit to get to class, a business owner relying on our strong trans highway network to get your goods to market, or a parent like me who's using local roads to get your kids to the nearby rink, we took your needs into consideration when developing this plan. Our government is saying yes to building critical transportation infrastructure and saying yes to getting more options for Ontarians to get around. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for that answer. Speaker, we saw that the Liberals knew rapid population growth was headed to the Golden, Greater Golden Horseshoe, and instead of addressing it, they shelved crucial key highway projects like Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass. The Liberals failed to get shovels in the ground to build more public transit. They failed by sentencing a generation of GTA drivers to perpetual gridlock. And, Speaker, the Liberals' do-nothing approach isn't an option anymore. So could the minister please elaborate on what key actions are in this government's transportation plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and how this government is getting it done for the people of Ontario? Mr. Transportation. Thank you again to the member from Niagara West for the question. Speaker, I've said it before in this House. If we don't take strong action now, gridlock will only get worse in this province. In fact, it's forecasted to triple over the next three decades. I know the frustrations of sitting in bumper-to-bumper -bumper tra bumper -bumper traffic each day firsthand. Yet every single day, Speaker, we hear no from the Liberals and the NDP on that side of the House who would rather keep Ontarians trapped in gridlock forever. Speaker, our government is embarking on the largest transit expansion plan in Canadian history. We're expanding GO service to deliver on our mandate of two-way, all-day GO service on core segments of the network including in the region of Niagara, where we have already increased the number of GO train, go train trips per day by 20%, 27% on weekdays and 23% on weekends. Speaker, we are also saying yes to building critical Spons? infrastructure projects like the Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass, as well as, Speaker, the Morriston Bypass. Our government is addressing gridlock and addressing population growth head-on, and I hope the members opposite will join us in this work. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Good, Speaker. Thank you. It's a good morning. My question is to the Premier. Speaker and Snabek Nation Grand Chief Reg Niganobi and Nishnabe Aski Nation um, Deputy Grand Chief Anabedi Ajinabiskam are at Queen's Park today calling on this government for immediate action in Thunder Bay regarding their police services. All Indigenous people have the right to feel safe and be treated equitably within the city of Thunder Bay, especially by those sworn to serve and protect. What action has this government taken since we learned that the Thunder Bay Police Services failed to properly investigate the deaths of 14 Indigenous people? Thank you, Speaker. You know, misconduct um, allegations must 
and are taken very seriously by our government. When we started to hear about the very serious allegations that were coming out of Thunder Bay, uh, I wrote to the Ontario Civilian Police Commission. Uh, they, of course, as you know, have started a review in January. Uh, that review is ongoing, uh, specifically related to the deaths. Uh, the OPP are doing an independent investigation. That uh, work has already begun. Um, look, when we heard from the chief pathologist and the coroner about their concerns about these deaths, uh, they did the right thing. They did that independent review. They gave it to the, um, the Attorney General who Bonds. referred that information to the OPP. Those investigations are ongoing, and we will allow that to happen without political interference. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the, back to the Premier. The leaders of Anishinaabeg Nation and the Anishinaabeg Nation are here to tell this government that Indigenous people have no trust in the Thunder Bay Police. Their repeated failures to prob properly investigate the deaths of Indigenous people mean that an additional 25 unsolved cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls require an external review. Their families deserve answers. Systemic racism within the Thunder Bay Police is preventing justice for Indigenous people, and it is intolerable. Will this government immediately call for OPP oversight of the Thunder Bay Police? Mr. General. A member opposite and I and our government are in full agreement. These serious allegations must be and are being investigated by independents through the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, through the um, OPP. Those investigations must happen in order, exactly as you said, to bring back trust and faith in the police services in Thunder Bay and elsewhere. We've done that. Those investigations are ongoing, and we should not and cannot politically interfere in those independent uh, reviews as they take place. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Ottawa, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, recently, a serious problem that seems to exist in Ontario has come to my attention. It's something that I find hard to believe or very discouraging. A comprehensive study last year found that 39% of hospitals in Ontario do not have sexual assault evidence kits available to victims. These kits provide really important evidence to trial in cases of sexual violence. Unfortunately, it seems that these kits are not always available. I also recently heard something else disturbing, that some victims of sexual assault have been asked to pay for rape kits in provinces. That is extremely disturbing, and it's a manifestation of rape culture that should not be allowed it to happen in Ontario. So my question is, I have tabled a private member's bill just yesterday to address the problem of rape kit availability and to ensure that they always are available for free. Will the government support my bill? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government has zero tolerance for workplace violence. One incident of workplace violence is one too many. And that is why the Ministry of Health, along with the Ministry of Long-Term Care and Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, acknowledge that workplace violence and workplace violence prevention continues to be a critical issue in the health care sector. That's why we are working already with our partners like Ontario Health and the Public Services Health and Safety Association to develop strategic approaches to address this very important issue. Most recently, our government published a workplace violence prevention guide to the law for employers to help health care organizations understand their obligations to prevent workplace violence under the Ontario Health and Safety Act. The supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And maybe I can offer the minister to read my private member's bill because we're talking about availability of rape kits and sexual assault. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in Canada, only th 33 out of every 1,000 sexual assaults are reported to the police. Where women clearly do not feel that policing and justice are responding to their needs. We've seen numerous movements call out the systemic racism at play in Ontario's policing. Police can't do their job properly if they don't have the confidence of the general public. We need to be bringing perpetrators of sexual assault to justice. What is the Solicitor General doing to ensure that there can be public trust in the OPP so that women, every woman, uh, Indigenous, Black women, and every woman feel comfortable reporting sexual assault? Mr. General. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I think the first and most important thing is that people have confidence to come forward and place those charges. You know, we have some incredible police leaders who are doing excellent work to make sure that there is standard processes so that when people come forward, they have confidence in the police service to make sure that those investigations are happening. And that work is ongoing. Absolutely. I will not disagree with you there. What we are doing is making sure that pe people understand what their rights and responsibilities are and to make sure that the police have the tools. And that's frankly why we have now some grants and programs in place to have police services work with their local um, sexual assault agencies, to work with their homeless shelters, to make sure that those communications and relationships are there in place so that when someone comes forward, not Spots. only can the charges come forward, but they can also get and are provided provided the supports they need as they go through the criminal justice system. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Question to the Minister of um, Skills Development. Small towns. Ontario is back and ready to unleash our economic potential and start firing on all cylinders. But we need all hands on deck. In the construction sector alone, we will need over 100,000 more workers over the next decade. These good jobs with pensions, benefits, and bigger paychecks are right here in Ontario for the taking. Our mission, under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, is to help more people reach them. This includes our strategy to get more women involved into skilled trades. Minister, you were recently in Ottawa to announce an exciting investment. Can you please tell us how this announcement will benefit the people of Ottawa? Mr. Labour Training and Skills Development. Thank you uh, so much to the member for this uh, very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as a member uh, said recently, I had the pleasure of uh, traveling to our nation's uh, capital to join uh, my colleagues and members from Carleton and Ottawa West Nepean. Together, we announced our government is investing over $13 million in free training and paid electricians apprenticeships for more than 2,500 people across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, electricians make everything possible uh, that we enjoy in life. Their cables kept us all connected with families, with friends and work colleagues at a time when we couldn't be together. This is part of our Workers First plan for Ontario. We're helping people lift themselves up, support their families, and give back to their communities. Thanks. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response and for working hard to get it done. Wow. Through you, Speaker, it's clear these are rewarding and well-paying careers. Construction electricians make about $34 an hour. Industrial electricians make $36 an hour. Power system electricians, $47 an hour. And many electricians earn more than $50 an hour. Mr. Speaker, last year there were over 1,800 job postings for electricians. With over $2 billion in infrastructure projects on the horizon, we need to ensure our workforce is ready to meet this demand. We need these workers to build and maintain our roads, hospitals and schools for Ontario's growing population. So, Speaker, what is the minister doing to give a hand up to those who work hard and take pride in a job well Question. done? Minister of Labour to reply. Well, thanks uh, again, and through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for her advocacy 
and continued uh, support to get more people uh, into the skilled trades. Uh, speaker, our announcement in Ottawa was about more than just training. We're breaking new ground, taking historic steps, and passing first-of-their-kind legislation that builds a stronger Ontario for everyone. It shows our government is working for workers every single day, and we're not slowing down. We're putting those who work an honest shift in the driver's seat and helping average people and their families get ahead. We've got a workers' first plan to build a brighter future for Ontario that works for everyone. Through you, Mr. Speaker, our government is all in, and we're going to get it done under Premier Ford. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontarians are struggling to make ends meet, and one of the greatest expenses that they face is car insurance. But instead of helping Ontarians in lowering rates, the Conservative government continues to allow billion-dollar billion dollar car insurance companies to rip off Ontarians by charging them more simply based on where they live. It is postal code discrimination, and it is wrong. Last week, alongside other NDP MPPs, I put forward a bill to lower car insurance rates by ending postal code discrimination. Will the Premier do the right thing? Will he vote yes to our NDP bill to stop postal code discrimination and lower rates, or will he continue to allow his insider friends in the car insurance industry to rip off Ontarians. The member for Brantford Brant, parliamentary assistant. No, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that question. Our government has been keeping a very close watch on the insurance companies across Ontario to make sure that they are treating the people of Ontario uh, fairly during this unprecedented time. And we have had a clear message to insurance companies. You should provide relief in funds to reflect the financial hardships of your customers are facing because of COVID-19. And because of that, because of the encouragement of the province of Ontario, we have seen a billion dollars in consumer savings, affecting 93% of Ontario drivers. And in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, David Marshall's report that came out a few days ago just stated that um, in 2019, since, since 2019, FISRA has been active in reducing the regulatory burden. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario work very hard, and our government understands that taxpayers are under pressure. We recognize the impact that inflation is having on our families and that our government is here for them. Our government is committed to putting and keeping more money in the pockets of hardworking Ontarians. Examples, for example, the jobs training tax credit of $2,000, low income workers lift credit. Mr. Speaker, every opportunity that the opposition has had to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario, they have said no. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. We have just heard how out of touch the Conservative government is. I challenge the Premier to go to Brampton, to go to Scarborough, to go to Northwest Toronto, ask folks there order. if their car insurance rates have gone up government or go down. Come to order. They will tell you that the rates have gone up order. and people are struggling because of it. And it's no surprise because every single year that the Conservative government has been in power in 2018, in 2019, in 2020, in 2021, and in 2022, they have allowed car insurance rates to go up. And on top of it, they have voted no to two NDP bills that would actually have ended and lowered car insurance rates. Enough is enough. The Premier needs to stop serving his insider friends in the car insurance industry and start serving Question. the people of Ontario. Will he vote yes to our NDP bill and lower car insurance rates once and for all? Right on. Member for Grant for Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I appreciate that in the Marshall Report that was just released, no mention was made about how making auto insurance more expensive for the rest of the people of Ontario would serve any benefit. In fact, what he's saying is that the future of consumer services like insurance lies in being responsive to rapid changes such as pricing and innovation. We recently implemented through FISRA a regulatory sandbox to test new initiatives to respond to changing consumer needs. Successful innovations from this sandbox would be delivered to the consumer market. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is, is that the people of Ontario need real relief. 
making life more affordable and convenient for over 8 million vehicle owners by eliminating li license plate renewal fees. The minimum wage increase, a raise of over 660,000 to over 760,000 Ontario workers, removing the unfair tolls imposed on highways 412 and 418 by the Del Duca Liberal government and addressing the housing crisis. Mr. Speaker, every chance that the opposition has had to say yes to the Spons? people of Ontario, they have said no. Jim, Jim, Jim. The next question, the member for Durham. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I understand this is a timely question. Uh, Oshawa is now one of the most expensive places to rent an apartment in all of Canada. A real estate listing and analysis firm's numbers says Oshawa saw the average two-bedroom unit in, in Oshawa jump by a staggering 24.8 per cent this month, reaching a new high of 18.60 per month. I recognize, Minister, you inherited a huge housing backlog when you became minister. What more can we do as a parliament? What more can you do to help my Oshawa constituents like Ontario Tech students who are going to soon graduate who are looking for a place to rent? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Through you to the member uh, for Durham. Uh, I want to thank you for the question. Thank you for your advocacy uh, in your riding. I uh, really appreciate uh, the interest on the housing file. You're right. We uh, inherited a housing file that was, uh, for the most part, neglected by the previous government for 15 years. We, uh, we went at it very quickly with our Housing Supply Action Plan. And as you know, uh, both in 2020 and 2021, the years following the Housing Supply Action Plan, we've had significant increases. Uh, in Durham uh, alone, in the members' riding, uh, since we implemented our plan, there's been about 4,200 housing starts, which is about a 58% average from 2019. It's, it's higher than the average for 10 years. But regardless of that, your points are well taken, and it, it only shows the fact that our work is not done. We need all of our partners, including uh, municipalities, uh, to, to do their share to Response. make sure that that long, drawn-out process that's really causing uh, undue delays uh, needs to stop. So your question's very timely, and, and I'll have more to say so later on today. So. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to specifically thank uh, the minister for his collaboration on the release of a co-owning a home guide earlier in the term. Uh, one of the potential solutions for those finding themselves priced out of the market. Uh, in February, the average Durham Region home reached an all-time high of $1.2 million. As we near the end of the term of this parliament, what other solutions can you offer to benefit my constituents? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. And again, uh, through you to the member for Durham, I, I want to thank you for your leadership on uh, the co-ownership co uh, innovation guide that we've done, highlighting uh, the Golden Girls uh, in your riding. So thank you for your, for your leadership. Um, we want to build upon uh, some of the measures that we've put forward as a government. Obviously, uh, my housing uh, task force report, very bold, visionary, uh, sets out sort of a longer-term plan uh, for the government. But we know it doesn't matter what consultation that we had. Uh, the member knows that, that the, the process takes too long. It, it literally takes too long uh, to, to start a process and get shovels in the ground. And that's something that, that we've heard throughout the, the consultation. We, we want to put a plan in place, but we want to continue that consultation, multi-generational uh, communities, uh, to ensure that there's a rural and northern lens uh, on the housing file, which I know the members uh, you know, very, very interested in. This is a long-term strategy. Response. It's not a one and done. And, and I think you'll see in the years ahead uh, that, that our government under the leadership of Premier Ford will have many, many more housing initiatives to deal with the supply problem. Here, here. Next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Mines, Northern Development, Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, it's been long, long uh, being observed, observed that the gap between Northern and Southern Ontario is more than just a geographic one. We have known for quite some time that the northern portion of our province has been left wanting for investment. Whether investment in health care, infrastructure, or even just investment in, in uh, consideration into formulating strategies to improve life for our northern, remote, and indigenous communities, it's clear that the previous administration was uninterested 
and instead solely fixated on the southern urban regions of our province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is our government and his ministry bridging that gap to build a stronger, more inclusive Ontario? And to respond, the Minister of Northern Development, Mines, Matcher Forestry. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Perth Wellington for his legacy in this place and the incredible work he's done for his constituents and our government over the past couple of years. But, Mr. Speaker, up north, we're talking about opportunities. You know, I started out in Cochrane, went to Iroquois Falls, to Miskaming Shores, Sturgeon Falls, Calstock, Mr. Speaker, where on behalf of the Minister of Energy, we announced a biomass strategy. Lac des Îles with the Premier Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, talking about our critical mineral strategy. There's a palpable enthusiasm across Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, that we have an opportunity to serve global demands, that we have an opportunity to be part of an integrated supply chain, Mr. Speaker, from exploration to electric vehicles. That means investing in our businesses, investing in infrastructure for our communities. It's why we modernize the Northern Response. Ontario Heritage Fund. Mr. Speaker, Northern Ontario is appreciative of the work this government's doing, and we're ready, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's clear that the minister's efforts to create a new and improved Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation are manifesting into real-world results for people and businesses across nor the North. Facts are this. Since June 2018, we have invested more than $473 million in 4,244 projects in Northern Ontario through the NOHFC, leveraging more than $1.5 billion in investment and creating or sustaining over 6,600 jobs. What is clear is that many northern communities were forgotten under past governments, liberal and our uh, under past governments, and our government was elected to clean up their mess. Speaker, through you, how is the minister turning these communities across the north into economic hubs? Minister of Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade shares my view that we have the most amazing Premier, Mr. Speaker, who is focused on the priorities of the North. He knows when it comes to agriculture that the Clay Belt, Thunder Bay District and Fort Francis Rainy River represent three of the largest growth areas for agriculture. He knows, Mr. Speaker, that the tariff pre President Biden slapped on Russia, and rightly so, for their hardwood, plywood, uh, birch, Mr. Speaker, is now going to be demanded from, from Cochrane, Mr. Speaker. That's why we invested $3.5 million in a new four-foot lathe up there. He knows, Mr. Speaker, that in mining, we have an opportunity to fill the gap, Mr. Speaker, and the global demand in the context of this strike strife for critical minerals, Mr. Speaker. The European Union has come to the Premier and myself for a meeting to form a street strategic alliance. Response. They're now asking us for our timber and our food. Mr. Speaker, Northern Ontario is busy, and the NDP have voted against all of these uh, important initiatives, Mr. Speaker. We're ready up north, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The COVID-19 fatality rates for people with disabilities are two and a half times higher than the general population. They have largely been left out of conversations around supporting Ontarians through, through this pandemic, especially when discussing the protection of residents in long-term care facilities and group homes. Speaker, one group home here in Ontario had a 95 percent infection rate during the height of the pandemic. This is shocking. Ontarians with disabilities do not deserve this. They do not deserve to be left on the sidelines of this conversation. This government needs to stop ignoring people with disabilities. The health and well-being of people in Ontario who have a disability needs to be prioritized. Can the Premier tell us what his government is doing to protect individuals in group homes as the province reopens? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. Our government is committed to ensuring the safety of those in our group homes and under children's uh, community and social services purview. Uh, that is why we have seen unprecedented uh, investments in this area to support 
our, our vulnerable populations. Our government has uh, understood the impact of COVID-19, and that's why we've backed up uh, our communities and our group homes uh, with real supports. More than 250,000 recipients and their families received the emergency benefit introduced in March 2020 to help individuals who may have faced addi additional costs due to COVID-19. To support individuals, we also expanded access to temporary emergency assistance for those in financial crisis who have had no access to other supports. ODSP and OW recipients continue to have access to the government's Response. discretionary benefits. Uh, we are working with our other ministries, the Ministry of Labour, Training, Skills it's Development, done. the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the um, uh, Minister, Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, to uh, allow a plan for renewal and recovery uh, for this sector. Thank you. The supplementary question. for people with disabilities, and this has only gotten worse under this government. In many cases, a person has to wait up to 23 years for appropriate supportive housing. 23 years, Speaker. Can you imagine anyone in this chamber having to wait over two decades to receive housing and support that they need? I bet not. Ontarians with disabilities are overrepresented among those living in poverty and in emergency shelters, which is completely unacceptable. They deserve stability, and they deserve to have access to appropriate housing options now, not two decades from now. Can the Premier tell us what his government is doing to expand the appropriate housing and care options for people with disabilities and to protect them from future outbreaks? Mr. Mr. and Housing. Uh, thanks, Speaker. I want to thank the, uh, the honourable member for the question. Uh, one of the things our government is doing uh, as a result of our supportive housing consultation was to take an all-of-government approach on this issue. We're working collaboratively. Obviously, Minister Fullerton just uh, responded to the first part of the question, but she and I uh, and, and our, our ministers in health, Minister Elliott and Minister Tobolo, are taking that all-of-government approach when it comes to supportive housing. So one of the things that we heard from our stakeholders was there's there's too many programs. So I made an announcement uh, in uh, Durham Region with uh, our chief government whip uh, to announce our homelessness prevention program, which basically takes some of our supportive housing programs uh, and, and rolls them into one to make it easier and more flexible to our service managers. What we've also done, Speaker, we've added more dollars uh, to Spons. municipal partners so that they're able to get that immediate improvement to the system today, not 10 years from now. And they Speaker. fully support us. Member for Scarborough Gilderoy. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. According to the FAO Expenditure Monitoring Report for Q3, the government's reduced planned spending on health, children's and social services, and education, choking off supports to some of Ontario's most important services and programs. During a global pandemic and lockdowns are bad enough. But the FAO's Q3 report showed us again that this government is hoarding billions of dollars in contingency and unallocated funds. What are these billions of unallocated funds for? There always seems to be a lack of transparency when it comes to this government. But what we do know is this. It was not to help Order. Ontarians get through this pandemic. Instead, Order. it was set aside for March Madness, a $5.6 billion pre-election spending spree. Speaker, the Premier in 2019 called March Madness Question. spending a waste of taxpayers' dollars. So why did he choose to waste $5.6 billion now? To reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as the member would know, that uh, the Minister of Finance uh, updated uh, on his own quarterly reportings, where he noted that we are investing an additional $2.3 billion to support the people of this province. Yeah, yeah. Every step of the way uh, to support uh, the people of this province, we have invested. There is no government in the history of this province that invested more in health care, more in education more to support the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and we've continued that. Uh, just like last week, where we announced uh, one of the first new medical schools in the city of Brampton yeah, yeah, in over 100 yeah. years in the GTA. That also, Mr. Speaker, includes a new medical school in Scarborough wow. that the people of Scarborough wow. will be able to utilize, Mr. Speaker. We've got a commitment to build over 
3,000 new beds over 10 years and $22 billion behind them, Mr. Speaker. Wow. We will continue to make record investments to keep the people of this province safe and to build on our progress to date. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to um, the President of the Treasury Board. I worked on that new medical school before you took office, so I appreciate the fact that— oh. The government side will come to order. Please restart the clock. Member for Scarborough Guildwood has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, I did work on this Scarborough Academy of Medicine before you took office. So I want to see those programs get built. The fact is, the people of Ontario and of Scarborough are waiting for services that this government has delayed, like the families on autism that are waiting for services, the ODSP program, which is underspent in the face of rising inflation, seniors who are on fixed incomes, they need to hear from this government that there is a plan to ensure that they can have a dignified retirement. What about the learning gaps? Why are you delaying those important programs and Question. leaving people hanging? Speaker, does the Premier think that breaking his budget deadline for selfish reasons is the leadership that Ontarians deserve? Because you've changed that deadline. It should, you should have been reporting this budget this week Order. instead of the end of April. You are keeping people waiting when they are in need of much-needed programs and services in this province. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. There is no government in the, the history of this province that has invested more to support the people of this province than this government. Mr. Speaker, let's take a look at the record of the members opposite. They voted no to over $1.5 billion in additional spending to support hospitals. That included 3,100 new surge beds. And those two in the members' own community oh, of Scarborough. Oh, wow. Foreigner. Mr. Speaker, you do that? the Foreigner. members opposite have voted no to historic Shame. capital investments to increase the supply of hospital Shame. beds Shame. in this oh, province. Oh. It's a 56 new major capital projects over the course of 10 years. Why the members opposite have voted no towards that, Mr. Speaker. The members on this side of the House are going to be committed Bonds. to making life more affordable building hospital beds, building capacity, and building that new medical school in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Good job. Good job. The next question, member for North South Western. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Parents of children and young people with autism have long struggled for financial and structural support they require to get the proper care they deserve. We know the previous Liberal government let parents down, and under this government, the wait list have doubled. In York Southwestern, one such parent is Alexis, whom my office has been trying to help. Alexis has been frustrated with the lack of communication from Ontario Autism Program and has no funding support for her child and no end in sight to the length wait list. Why will this government not step up to the plate and address how Ontario Autism Program is simply not working and the waitlist is clearly unacceptable. And to respond, the uh, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that important question. 
Uh, our government has been committed to making sure that the children and their families get the supports they need, and that's exactly why we've been creating a program for the community, by the autism community. That's why we've doubled the investment. That's why we have approximately 40,000 children receiving supports right now through the plan, which is a multi-pathway program providing supports in multiple ways and that's why we did consultations listen to the community understand the needs to create a new program through the independent intake organization which has now been announced and we're moving forward making very good progress unlike the previous government that had 75 percent of children who would never receive any supports and that Response. was supported by uh, you know the the NDP what did you do to address this issue. What Member for Hamilton do? Mountain, come so to order. There is an Bonds. important progress that is being made. We're on track to getting five times as many children into this program as previous. The data supports that. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. This Saturday is World Autism Awareness Day. And back to the, uh, my question to, for, to the Premier. Alexis has met barriers when trying to access the Ontario Autism Program, and with the Special Services at Home Program, it, in fact, her SSAH application was, in fact, lost, and she had to resubmit it. The Special Services at Home updated Alexis a few days ago, saying she cannot get a client number until funding is approved, and that the waiting list for her son is on is contingent on when and how much the government funds SSAH. Alexis sent a letter to the Minister of Social Services, and I was copied on, and I quote, we have been told earlier intervention is key for supporting kids with ASD, and if Question. you haven't figured it out by now, Emmett's early intervention window is quickly passing. Alexis has deep fears of her son's regression without getting the funding she needs, and in fact is fearful for this for his well-being. Families deserve so much better and, w and, and with a wait list of 53,000 children. When is this government going to provide the urgent help needed for, the, for their children's development? Mr. Children, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. Let me, let me uh, first of all, acknowledge the challenges that families have had and the importance of the progress that we're making to bring families into these programs. And I, I dispute the, the number that you're suggesting for the 50,000. The actual reality is that we have 40,000 children receiving support well right well now. Done. Children and youth in the behavior plans, 3,665. A childhood budget funding, uh, a payments issued, 8,682. 32,000 for, for Hamilton Mountain the come to order. Interim funding for the foundational family services, 12,914. The opposition had the chance to support children and youth with special needs. They said no to the Grandview uh, Children's Treatment Center in Ajax. They said no to the One Door for Care uh, in, in Ottawa. They said no to the Chatham. Kent's Children Treatment Centre. They voted against this funding and these investments not, wise, not once but twice. Our government is supporting. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Families in Ontario have paid the price for the Premier's dithering and delay as the last jurisdiction to sign a childcare deal in Canada. And they will pay the price if there are not enough spaces Order. available. Here's the bottom line. Ontario will not have enough child care spaces if there are not enough early childhood educators to care for our children. There's already a shortage of ECEs because of low pay and poor working conditions. Graduation rates at the Ontario College of Early Childhood Educators have declined by 7 per cent every year since 2014. Speaker, care providers deserve fair wages. So will the Premier say yes to ECEs Question. and the children and families who need them by offering a $25 an hour pay for ECEs. Respond, Minister of Education. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've delivered what no Liber Liberal Premier could, which is affordable childcare for the people of Ontario. Under Premier Ford's leadership, we have announced a plan that will reduce rates by 25 per cent on average up front this spring, an additional 50 per cent by Christmas of this year. We will get to $10 by year 2025, a monumental initiative that will provide relief and stability for families who need it, young families in our province. Mr. Speaker, we value the work of early childhood educators. It's why in this deal we have a minimum wage of $18 and $20 for supervisors. Mr. Speaker, 75 percent of our workforce is above that. We're trying to create equal, uh, an equilibrium of wages within the sector to retain them and incentivize 14,000 more to enter our, our industry. Mr. Speaker, we've landed not any deal, but a better deal for the people we serve. Speaker, we need to have an honest conversation with the people of Ontario about the fact that you need ECEs to be able to staff the spaces to deliver the affordable child care that people want and need. Paying care providers a fair wage is just the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for nurses, educators, and child care workers. It reflects the values of who we are as Ontarians. But if that doesn't convince the government to do the right thing, maybe basic economics will. You don't have to be a labour economist to understand that low wages in a tight labour market will make it difficult, if not impossible, to hire the workers needed. Manitoba gets it. They're paying $25 an hour. Yukon gets it. They're paying $30 an hour. Question. So why doesn't the Ford government get it at $18 an hour? Speaker, will the Premier stand up, do the right thing, and pay ECEs the fair wages they deserve? Mr. Vegetation. Mr. Speaker, in the agreement that was publicized for the people of Ontario, we confirmed to a minimum wage of $18. Every year in this, in this agreement, thereafter, it rises to a dollar, up to $25 at a maximum, Mr. Speaker. Uh, also, the province of Ontario unilaterally put in $395 million to ensure that uh, child care workers who work, within, work with staff and kids 6 to 12 years old, which are excluded from this federal deal, also get that wage increase. We didn't have to do that, but we believe it was the right thing to do to stabilize the workforce and encourage 14,700 more ECEs to step forward to help fill the 86,000 spaces that our progressive Conservative government is creating. We have put more money in the child care system. We're maintaining the Ontario child care tax credit, which the members of the Greens, Liberals and New Democrats have opposed systematically in this Response. House. We're going to continue to invest in families, reduce fees, and make life more affordable for families in Ontario. Question number four, Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Right now in Algoma, Manitoulin, communities are facing many shortages of permanent doctors. In Thessalon, the North Shore Health Network has been searching for a full-time physician at the local hospital for months. They are scrambling. They are relying on locums to fill the urgent need at the hospitals, while primary care, which is the gold seal of our care here in this province, is basically non-existent. Weeks ago, I presented a plan with, to the minister from the East Algoma Primary Care work team to create an integrated care model to help recruit and retain, retain new physicians in the area. The current model of care is simply not sustainable in the area. This has been going on for years, and this problem, minister, is not going away. We're looking to Question. you for your help. Can you let us know what is the government's plan to train, recruit, and retain physicians in Northern Ontario? Minister Health. Thank you very much, and thank you to the member for a question. We have had several conversations about the issue that you just described. You did present your plan to me, and we are studying it. We understand the urgency for it. We know that you need to have a solution, and we are giving a priority in our office. I can certainly advise you of that. In the longer term, however, you know that we are expanding medical placements for medical students significantly across Ontario. The biggest increase for the past 10 years, 160 undergrad positions, 295 postgrad 
graduate positions. I recognize that won't help in the immediate instance that you're speaking about. However, it is going to greatly increase the number of doctors who are going to be available in Ontario, particularly in Northern Ontario, because the Northern Ontario School of Medicine is receiving 30 undergraduate positions and 41 postgraduate yeah, positions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa Vanier has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Health concerning the availability of sexual assault evidence kits. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 89, an act to amend the Human Rights Code with respect to religious expression. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.